he is based in Los Angeles and he published his first novel, House of Leaves, um, back in March of 2000. Since then, House of Leaves has become a modern literary classic. It has been one of the most influential novels in both the horror and experimental genres. Um, Daniel Lepsky's work transcends the norm. He consistently pushes boundaries. He redefines what literature is and intimately explores the nature of, of storytelling itself. In 2006, Daniel Lepsky's novel, Only Revolutions, was the finalist for the prestigious National Book Award. Since then, he's gone on to write the first five installments of the Familiar series, um, an illustrated book called The Little Blue Kite. And just this year, he adapted House of Leaves into a screenplay and wrote the short story, There's a Place for You. Needless to say, we are honored to be hosting such an unconventional and exciting storyteller with us today. And I, for one, am very much looking forward to the next hour and a half um, of our discussion. So just a reminder to everyone um, joining us, um, submit your questions in the chat. You'll be able to address Daniel Lefsky himself after um, general discussion um, ends. Um, I guess with that, I'd say, let's just get started. Mark, thank you for joining us today. I see someone named Sebastian with an owl in the background. <laughs> I quite like it. Hey, <laughs> hello to everyone. This Hi, is a strange little room we're in, but we are in a room of sorts, even if, even if it's not constructed in the same way with all the familiar right angles, there are right angles and, and ways of kind of navigating space between each other so let's see what sure. we can do <laughs> yeah all right and um so to start off uh, with our discussion we're we're just going to go through a, a couple of um, general questions first and then we'll get into the more nitty-gritty um questions so um you know, of course, looking at your work, um, you incorporate many different visual elements into, um, into your written work. So to start off, could you speak to what you feel is meaningful about combining visual art with, um, with written art? The first thing is it, is it comes from a very deep place. Um, when I was, uh, when I was, you know, very young, I was taught in a manner that was all about writing on the line, writing between the lines, you know, with a certain type of script. Um, and it certainly was encouraged by my mother who was trained in a certain way of writing, which was near identical to her mother's uh, type of writing. Uh, but, you know, change was afoot when I was, was born in the late sixties. And uh, certainly pop art, pop art and advertising was starting to become the norm. And even if I didn't quite have the vocabulary to frame those sort of visual influences, they were all about. And uh, I was uh, want like many kids to just draw things as well as write things to explore that kind of um, visual language, which seemed like such a good friend, a sibling, a twin, if you will, to the to the actual pure lexical experience that was being, you know, taught by my teachers. Um, and really what happened is that I just persisted, you know, I kept, I kept at it. And, uh, and, you know, I realized that there was a way to, to explore this language without, without having to give it up, you know, and, uh, and then when the, uh, the map came around, it provided immediately, you know, five or six fonts that could be played with. And suddenly there was a way of kind of reincorporating that kind of handwritten experiment into a much more um, easily uh, replicated uh, form. And, and then, you know, became the experience that, that, that was to formally become House of Leaves. Uh, and, and that entailed not only that personal exploration of the visual, you know, the cinematic, which was hugely influenced by my father's teachings. He was a, 
He was a director as well as a professor of film and stage. Um, but also beginning to encounter those kind of social negotiations that go on as you, en as you enter a marketplace. You know, what was feasible? What, what, could, what could the publisher effectively do? And I was very fortunate to land at a publishing house like Pantheon, which is part of the Knopf group at Random House, um, where they were starting to move into the world of, of graphic novels. And so that kind of language, albeit strange for this type of book, was not entirely unfamiliar. Um, but nonetheless, I was, I was blessed with a great editor who allowed me to to fly to New York, that was on my dime, uh, and live at the publishing house for two or three weeks where I actually typeset all of the really complex um, chapters, specifically chapter nine, the labyrinth chapter. Uh, and the greatest thing about this was not only did I have the kind of you know, tech support there from, from people who were in the know about what kind of files were permissible for reproduction in a big publishing house, um, but it afforded me the opportunity to meet everyone and slowly begin to explain why this wasn't just Dadaist art, why, why, how there was in fact a kind of a narrative con you know, construction involved. And uh, you know, I worked very hard. I knew it was a rare opportunity, near mythical even then. And, and it's even more now, I mean, especially as we're sort of isolated in this pandemic, the thought that we could go to an office, even our own office seems incredible. Uh, so I was there at 6 a.m. and I was bringing good coffee and making coffee there so that by the time people started coming around seven or whatever it was, they began to smell great coffee on the floor. And then I began to, you know, I, I stayed late. And so I was there when all the lights were out. But, but I, think, I think that sort of demonstration, even though I wasn't thinking about it at the time, I was just trying to get everything done and, um, as speedily and as effectively as possible, did did, did sort of show my, you know, my determination. And from then on, you know, that kind of visual, you know, exploration continued until finally sort of getting frustrated by how it was being framed academically, I decided to come up with my own word um, other than postmodern, which I think is an ineffective way of kind of rendering the exploration that I'm on. And I called it signaconic. And it's very simple. It's basically sign plus icon. It's that idea of the lexical plus the visual and how they, they, can, they can combine to actually create a moving experience. And, um, you know, if you can come up with your own, you know, term, that would be fantastic. Maybe, maybe there's a different way to frame this, this conversation, but I feel like it's an effective term to say, hey, let us allow there to be a visual component to the way words move. And, um, you know, even during the pandemic, my wife and I have, have kind of been laughing about the amount of time that we're spending with each other to the point that there's a kind of chatter that you're not always able to render meaningful or meaningless. Like, was that an important thing that I was supposed to do or not do or how I was taking care of my daughter? And so we started to look at it about in terms of fonts, like, I would look at her and I would say, okay, darling, what I'm about to say is in the headline font, you know, mm -hmm. or she would tell me, you know what, this is kind of the podcast font. It's kind of in the background, you know, we don't really have to pay attention to everything, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. But the point being is that if, if you, if you kind of open yourself up to the way language moves as this, as this kind of terrifying ghost in a way, transcendent of our environment and yet part of its shapes and sounds, um, it does seem to demand something that's more than just columnar and, and black and white. And, um, and that's where I'm at. It's an ongoing exploration and, uh, and, and we'll see where it leads. Yeah, that's fascinating, yeah. <laughs> um, so you talked a little bit about your experience in the publishing house and how it is to be like published as an experimental author. How do you pitch your work, especially how did you pitch your work in the beginning when it was sort of becoming the thing that it is now? I think the, the main route has always been 
through, through an explicit discussion of what I'm doing. So instead of posturing as, as, as the artist who understands the work and is, and is freed from having to describe it at any length, um, I certainly was able to um, provide that kind of ongoing dialogue with my publisher. And I think one of the key elements that I actually learned from my father um, in the film world and even um, having lived in LA a bit, instead of, instead of creating out of the publisher um, parental figures that are somehow there, some, somehow there to, to validate you or, 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 or guide you in a sort of a very paternal or maternal way, I, I, from the get-go, treated my publisher um, the way I still do to this day as my partner. So they're investing a great deal. They're going to spend their you know, hours devoted to the production of this, the, 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 pub, the pub, publicizing of, of, this, of this work. So I need to at least be able to address what their concerns are. Now, I'm not talking about getting into every single nuance of the book, but I'm, but I, I can't, I can't, I, you know, I remember many a dialogue of, of, of describing how the labyrinth chapter in House of Leaves was supposed to slow the reader down, you know, it wasn't just a mess on the page, it was supposed to lead the, the reader in a different way, backwards through the text, elevate that kind of frustration, that fear that we, we often experience when we're lost. Um, only to be relieved in the second chapter, in the next following chapter, when actually you can read a hundred pages in a matter of moments. So I'm kind of giving you an example of how I was speaking with my, my publisher and, and my editor. Um, Only Revolutions was so far and beyond what House of Leeds was and so complex and born of a language all its own that my editor and I had to actually sit down and create a, a, a sort of scaffolding vocabulary to address each of these parts. Um, and so that was kind of fun, but that took a while, you know? And, uh, and so it's gone with, with every book. And I think if, if I can share any kind of suspected frustration um, that my publisher might have towards me is that each project seems to be so different. And it, you know, I can feel for them because it means how are we now going to introduce this book? You know, it's not simply the mysteries that he's known for or the cookbooks or whatnot. And, you know, in a, a day and age where there's so much noise and static in, in, in sort of in the digital sphere, it's very hard to kind of constantly do that. Um, so if you have any advice for them, please, please post somewhere so I can <laughs> communicate to them. Had to unmute myself. Okay, um, so here at UH Hilo, um, we were recently named the most diverse campus in the United States. Um, in your mind, what role does fiction play in promoting diversity? Oh, great, complicated, important question. Um, I want to land sort of more where I'm at than necessarily where we view the country. I mean, I think, how do we frame this? First and foremost, those who have voice, who have the privilege of voice are also given the responsibility to bring voice to those who don't have voice. So I think we're at, a, at an exciting, scary, complicated crossroads in that, um, you know, a white male doesn't need anymore to begin to give voice to various groups because they have grown powerful enough and sublime enough to, to free that voice into the, into the, into the world. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is a complicated subject because in the, um, in the familiar, there are, are a number of, of um, characters from, from different backgrounds with different ethnic uh, diversities, uh, uh, different 
ethnic backgrounds, different, different languages. And, and so there is this, this question like a, like a, like a, like a specter, if you will, of what, what, by what right do I have to include these voices if they aren't my own? Um, and it's, it's not, not an easily resolved question and, and, and whether I was successful at, at it or not remains to be seen. But, but the, the intention there was to, was to render sort, sort of the greater music of all of these voices and, and, and how they come together in a much grander communal um, sound, which leads me to a, you know, where I'm at now. But, um, but I also want to pause before I sort of reveal that kind of thinking by saying, you know, it wasn't also just me imagining what an Armenian cab driver would say but it was me very much like a reporter taking, you know, countless rides from a certain taxi cab company in Los Angeles and speaking firsthand with various Armenian drivers to learn about them, to hear their stories, to sort of, you know, the, the dialogue, the patter, the things that mattered and in that sense research what that music was like and what those concerns were. It was stepping out of my bubble into a different bubble. Um, and that goes, goes for Jing Jing and then actually traveling to Singapore, actually not just going to, to the malls there, but walking into the neighborhoods that aren't typically visited by tourists, meeting friends of friends of friends who could help guide me through that and begin to sort of you know, perceive at least somewhat the Singlish that is, that is commonly you know, spoken. Um, there among a certain set, et cetera, et cetera. So I still think that's a very in, in important um, kind of exploration is, is, is not to just limit yourself to your own music, but in a way kind of mute your own music so that you can grant space to other voices and, and allow some, some, you know, that great kind of concert to unfold. Now, what I alluded to earlier is where am I at now? I mean, it seems more and more um, the question of, of animality is rising and, and, and holding true to, to what, I, what I said earlier about granting voice to the voiceless. There, therein lies, you know, a mute subject that will never join us in, in, our, in, our, in our verbal sort of disquisitions of things. And, and, that, is, and that is the life that surrounds us. Um, and in the, so in these times, it's the question that I'm constantly asking is how do we give place to animals? How, how, how are they granted voice, especially in a way that's, that's not purely anthropomorphic, though it's hard to because language itself is so, is so human centric. Um, and I have, uh, you know, as, as, as kind of enthralled and terrified by the great, you know, the great cyclone of, of transition that we're all experiencing now in the, in the political realm, you know, there's a, there, there is a desire to find that kind of constancy and normalcy and, 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 and I'm certainly for, for that quiet. But I also have begun to wonder if something as sacred as democracy is, is in some ways already ready, tragically flawed by the etymology of its creation, if you will. That of demos meaning people, democracy is for the people, of the people, by the people. Um, and what I feel, and again, this is, I'm just sort of sharing where I'm exploring. I mean, these could be dead ends, but it's, it's really looking, looking at how one would create a biocracy, how one would create a, a community where life itself gets to vote. Now, obviously a blade of grass um, or a spore or a peacock isn't gonna make it into the voting booth, probably wouldn't be allowed anyway, um, if it could, but nonetheless, they should be accorded a vote. And I feel, I feel that that would in fact introduce a balance to this system, which is, which is wholly oblique and kind of falsely cantilevered lever, over an abyss that it cannot stay above if it doesn't allow 
this kind of um, connection, congruity, you know, this is where the words begin to, to fail me is how that would be accomplished. And it's not an easy thing to imagine. Um, but that, yes, that's where I'm, where I'm at now. You sort of gone right into our next question, which is like, in that vein, during the time of like COVID-19 and climate change and plague, war and fire, how is how can fiction help us and how is fiction relevant? Oh, well, if I may, I'd like to refine the question to how can novels help us? Will you permit Perfect, me to yeah. do that? Will that be okay? Of course, go ahead. Um, because I feel, or actually I believe um, that, that novels propose in their engagement with the reader an opportunity to not only sustain an engagement with an abstract narrative, um, um, but also to put into practice how we materialize in our mind what we know to be fiction. In other words, we are told that the novel is made up. We are told that it is a confection. And so then we engage it in a way that tests it for its engagement with the reality that we know, right? So uh, in other words, you know, is more simply, is the book consistent within itself? You know, do the rules that it's set up, are, are they broken or are they followed? Are the promises that are made at the beginning of the book kept at the end of the book? All of these things are a, a series of ways of, of, of kind of observing this, this creation. At the same time, that creation is also engaging our imaginative spirit. It's increasing it. It's allowing us to imagine the life of another, to, to feel the life of another, and, and hence empathize with another. This is, this is a, almost a sacred quality to novels, that they enable you access in a way that no image can, in a way the image already, by virtue of its dynamics, denies you presence within. It already asserts that I am here and, and you are there, whereas Whereas the, the book itself becomes this infinite, you know, choral movement within you, right? Now, why is that important? Well, especially today, because novels are training tools so that we may better parse the fictive narratives that are being spun wildly now more than ever. How do we recognize that the claim of voter fraud is a fiction? Well, those who read novels are better equipped, believe it or not, to understand what maps more closely to reality and what doesn't. We are aware of congruities, consist consistencies, um, all that tiny, tiny detail that can add up into something that is compelling and that makes sense in the world we live in or can be disregarded. Um, and so that, that becomes the ongoing sort of sacred devotion to, to, to novels is, is really in some ways, you know, that's how, that's how the Jedi's come around. They start with the novel. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fascinating concept to think of fiction allowing us to identify further fiction. I, I love that and I hadn't thought of that before. Um, so we, we've mentioned the familiar a couple of times um, during today. Uh, we have a couple of questions relating specifically to the familiar. Um, so at our campus at UH Hilo, um, many of our creative writing classes have a strong emphasis on you know, the drafting process. So going through multiple different drafts in order to develop a stronger piece, right? Um, so we're looking at the familiar and it's a very complex story, you know, lots of characters, like you said, they're all over the globe, lots of different backgrounds. Um, we were wondering, what did the very first draft of The Familiar look like? And was it different? And how was it different for, um, from what got published eventually? No, the, I published the first draft. That's exactly what it looked like. <laughs> it's, I, you know, I have no, 
I have no comprehension of, of the meaning of the first draft. I, I, uh, I think it's the most important thing for, for beginning writers, young writers um, to get over. The, the first draft is the, is the least important part. And uh, you know, the practice of writing in the beginning should really be writing you know, material that you will throw away. Um, and, and so there, you know, there's, it, it was, there was, there was such an immense design to, to the familiar that it, it could never live in that, in that way, at least not through me. Um, because, you know, future drafts come, come along to rewrite the beginnings and rewrite characters, you know, a simple, a simple example by way of just looping in also sort of the, the, the constant kind of emergent um, visual um, creativity that's part of my process is that just changing Xanther's font, Xanther's the name of the little girl who's the, really the, the central figure, um, began to change her voice, changing the letting, you know, the, the spacing changed Jing Jing's voice. And so that visual element then radically changed all the previous chapters and later chapters and, and whatnot. So um, I, you know, I, is there, is there a, even a note card where I, where I wrote down little girl finds drowning kitten? I, I don't think so, but there was, there was some sort of registry of this, you know, this central image of, of a cat and, and most importantly, one that, that had no voice and, and how would that emptiness, but yet assertion of presence and connectivity with an animal world that is constantly being denied, you know, bring itself into, into being. Um, you know, the new novel that I'm working on now I suppose you technically call it a first draft, but it too lived in sort of various ways and no cards kind of in, in moments in my head. And, and, and I get, again, I would sort of encourage um, beginning writers or even expert writers, you know, to be, to be at home with, with letting go of that idea of the first draft. You know, I mean, I've just today, I realized it was probably about a hundred pages that I was going to throw out you know, and, and there's an agony that comes with that, but there's also this elation because the reason for its jettison is that I've discovered something else that is, it is more meaningful, impactful, and resonant. So we're going to stick with the familiar for a second. Um, we came across this quote, scary isn't about when scary happens, it's about what happens before scary could happen. Would you like to elaborate on that idea a little bit? Uh, sure. I'm gonna call a friend here because it's just <laughs> kind of fun. <laughs> um, well, like this little cat who's eyeing who or what to pounce on soon. There is there is a lot invested in our in our anticipations, and um, I think I think. You know, there's a there's also um, a great deal of, of psychological and neuronal study that's being devoted to the importance of how we predict. And so, you know, um, uh, psychologists and neurobiologists can can talk about it as a as a predictive cascade. It requires a certain amount of energy, right? And there's a necessity to it. We, we are uh, fortunate to have and unfortunate to have certain instincts that can guide us very, very quickly within situations that, that elicit responses like running or, 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 or conjoining or, or, or whatever. But, but we're constantly, you know, and this is probably what, the, what consciousness is navigating those, those gray areas of how, of how do we interpret this this questionably valued um, experience that we're having, you know, is it something that threatens us? Is it something that's good for us? Is it something that we can just, you know, persist within without engaging? Um, 
And so a lot of scary things are not actually about that, about that moment, you know, the, the visceral encounter, but, uh, but actually, you know, beginning to understand that our predictive cascades are offering, you know, a very glum outcome. And then understanding like what that visceral interaction will be that could be very consequential in terms of, of, of pain or, or damage or whatnot. Um, and obviously this is a very important part of us. It's necessary, but it, it's also something that can lead to, to all sorts of states that are fraught with, with great difficulties. I mean, there, there's a thought that the depression may come out of just an excessive amount of predictive cascades. Everywhere you go, there's a constant cascade of what will happen and that expends energy. And so in a, in a way by, by making peace with where you're at, you, 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 can, you can let go to a certain degree of that, of that constant state of anticipation, which sadly too is, is often wrong because life circumstances are so complex that being able to, to proceed, you know, even a thousand, a hundred moves, 10 moves ahead is, is, very, is very complicated. Um, and so again, that is that, that, is that, that, that more internal engagement of how do I make peace with, with the narrative that I've constructed for myself and for the world. So, you know, a more personal example would be in the state of this, the pandemic, we, uh, you know, initially it was, there was an absolute terror of being able to go out, you know, how do I engage other people? You know, now some people I know decided that they wouldn't engage and some people I know actually caught COVID, you know, um, but what, what I've discovered among, you know, my family and, um, and sort of close and by close, I now need proximal friends, friends that I trust enough that I can actually engage in a sort of physical way is that, you know, doing the hard work engaging the science, beginning to construct a narrative that makes sense of how COVID is transmitted, where it's risky, where it's not, or whatnot, has enabled me to not have to think about it most of the time. Certain situations would, would, will engage me where I have to be extra prudent or whatnot, but I can now move around my house or go to a certain place and feel comfortable that, that the odds of me getting this are, are very low and transmitting. Um, that's another way of sort of how we engage these narratives. You know, part of it is uh, constructing facts and, 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 and conclusions that make sense and, and, help, and hence result in actions that free us from all these kind of anxious predictive cascades. Yeah, that's so interesting, almost finding comfort in, in facts a bit I like that. Well, and also the synthesis of the facts. There's not one fact. It's kind of, it's this aggregation of, of the work that you're doing. And, you know, like, like anything, it has to be, it has to be a, a well-chosen diet of sources that make sense. Because if you're on a very poor diet and you're only drinking, you know, sugared sodas and potato chips, you know, the, the mind will begin to, you know, you know, conclude things that, that, that might not guide you well. For sure, yeah. Um, so our next question is um, specifically relating to um, House of Leaves and Only Revolution. So uh, I know that both of those books have been translated into different languages. Um, could you speak a bit to what the process was like for those translators, as far as you know, um, you know, <laughs> uh, mo moving your moving your work into a different language? Oh, uh, you'll, I think you'll be somewhat disappointed. This has a, is a very short answer. Uh, you know, my belief is, is that the act of translation is, a, is an act of artistry unto itself. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm not that involved in the translation except to, to, um, to okay to choose a translator who, who seems, whose experience seems to merit, you know, the task ahead of her or him. And once that's done, I, I'm pretty much out of it because so many, so many things need to be, you know, understood, interpreted, rendered in a way that will, that will, that will, you know, that will, that will register for that language. Uh, 
So for example, in, uh, in Germany, when Only Revolutions was, was published, it was actually a, um, a husband and wife who worked on it. And the wife worked on Haley and the husband worked on Sam. And, and so they sort of, they, they came upon their language and then colluded on how that, that language, you know, intersected, combined, blew itself apart, you know? And so that was a process that I was very in favor of. And I think the results were, were, were magnificent. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, so, so we have, I happen to know a fair amount of theater and film nerds in the audience today. Um, and we heard that um, House of Leaves is adapted into a script. So when you're adapting that work, do you focus on adapting your book into a script or your vision of the project into a script? And are those things different? Ah, well, I mean, you're talking about a particular project. You're talking about something that may never actually happen, even though there have been, you know, exciting conversations with the likes of Netflix and Amazon and HBO and you name it. Um, the, uh, the thing was, was always how, you know, how to approach a material that is so visually about darkness. And I think what I finally began to see as, as a really exciting possibility was the television series. And this was an idea that, that, um, that I was talking about with, a, uh, with an AMC um, executive probably 10 years ago. And uh, he was on board because there was, we were going, we were entering that sort of efflorescent moment for, for television, which now is, is sort of everywhere as people anticipate the fourth season of The Crown, you know, the long form is, is definitely here. Uh, and that seemed to make a great deal of sense. Um, but the thing is, is that, is that, there, that there's a lot in, 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 in the film world that's, that's built around fear. You know, there's a there's there's a, a fear that of something that hasn't been done before, and and it's not a um, erroneous fear because it's it you know people are about to put 60, 70, 80 million dollars on the line, and and they have to try to figure out how is it that this is going to work, and and one of the tested ways, and it's not always um, proven correct, is you just simply hire someone who has a lot of experience and has made a lot of hits. And that is an easy way to go. So for an author like myself, who's really just been on the sidelines to come in and say, hey, this is my vision for this show, uh, has a very unlikely outcome. <laughs> you know? But what I had always begin to imagine was this, um, this kind of meta story. So that there was a story that was presented in present day about the slow uncovering of House of Leaves itself. And the big substitution and flip is that instead of actual pages within that trunk, it was, it was a trunk filled with all sorts of media. Images, uh, pictures, Polaroids, 16 millimeter, eight millimeter VHS, all of the actual shots that we crave when we're, we're um, reading in the book. And so I, I recently watched the, um, uh, an interesting series called Utopia. Did anyone see it? Not sure. If, uh, well, one of the one of the concepts that was was interesting was that there is this central graphic novel or comic book that is that that is sort of reveals all of these things. Um, and one of the critiques I would have for the show is as 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 sort of as propulsive and strange as the as the plot was around that um, that central material wasn't as compelling. It wasn't interesting. It, it quick, quickly flatlined with only sorts of, you know, just images that you weren't really allowed access to. Um, so the difference here is that that central story would be very compelling. So you have this sort of meta idea and, um, and then a slow unfolding of the actual footage of House of Leaves. And the reason for that is that I really wanted to explore one of the central themes of House of Leaves and, and, and what I think is really one of the reasons why it, it, it still read a new avidly um, 20 years later is that it it predicts early on the problematics of how we verify image 
you know, 20 years ago, we pretty much believed the image was sacrosanct. We knew better. Susan Sontag was telling us, you know, in a loud voice that, hey, there's a lot of things we have to look at in the image. But we really couldn't believe or anticipate that something like a deep fake could, could happen so effectively. And that's where we're at now, is how do we verify these images? How do we verify the narrative, right? And that is always the question with the Navidson record. And it's always the question with Johnny Truant. And it's always the question with Pelafina: is how do I find the narrative that allows me to live, that allows me to survive? that allows me to succeed, that allows me to find happiness and contentment and peace. And it is no easy job. And it is one that we will never be absolved of. We must always find the narratives that we live by. And um, I think it will, it will, it will be with the, with the human race for as long as, as, as humanity exists. Yeah, I love Maybe that. that would be the question on a t-shirt would be like, do you know your narrative? Something. yeah there you go <laughs> you write should, that one down <laughs> yeah you should create that one that would be an excellent one <laughs> all right so um when you set out to create a work and i'm thinking about you know the the new book that you're working on right now um how much does it change over the course normally? I mean, like you, you well, said- Well, I just said that. I, there was yeah. a, I had an understanding that would jettison, you know, 50, 100 pages. It changes <laughs> constantly. Exactly, yeah, precisely. So that's- um, Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the, the metaphors I've used is, is to be a glass blower. A novelist is a glass blower. You constantly want to keep the glass molten so you can shape it you know, or you have to reheat it so it's melting, you know, as soon as you try to just move it around when it when it's when it's cooled, it'll shatter. And so the idea is to be very relaxed in it, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, you have to, you have to free yourself from 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 that kind of rigidity, you know, and, and by the way, achieving that kind of that limberness requires that practice in your lifestyle, whatever that is, Tai Chi, yoga, you know, learning how to be a good surfer. If you're too st stiff out in the waves, right, you're going to get really hurt in a wipeout. So it's, it's learning to achieve a kind of a relaxed, you know, manner that you can actually then begin. I mean, it will literally translate into your hands, moving the pen or on the keyboard. It's, it's, it's allowing that kind of that flow in yourself. Um, and, and, and the gift of that is that, is that you won't deprive yourself of those wonderful, you know, fruits or blooms that suddenly happen 600 pages in where, yes, this amazing thing has just been offered to you by your, your constantly working intelligence and unconscious, um, but it will necessitate rewriting an enormous swath of, you know, of pages beforehand. And if you're so connected to that, if your predictive cascade is all about how much work that will take and how much time it will take, then it will, it will immediately erase what, what, what you've worked so hard to find. And so it's being relaxed enough to go, wow, this is so exciting. And so what if I have to go back? In fact, it's exciting to go back because you know, in a way it's gonna be heading to this place where it beautifully arrives. Um, and so in that sense, it is, you know, it's a, it, and I constantly remind myself and it's, it's complicated and difficult, but it's not just about the writing. It's also about how you eat, how you sleep, how you exercise, how you engage others. All of that is part of that concordance of language. And I would like to, you know, press here that it's also how you engage in, in the environment that you're in, how you observe the ants, the spider, the sparrow, the hummingbird, whatever it is. I mean, Hawaii, I wish I were there now, but it's obviously rich in environment. But that's not to say that even the most bleak place doesn't have within it this, this um, enormously powerful reminder as, a, as a, you know, some grass shoots up between two concrete, you know, slabs or whatnot. Life finds a way and it's, it's, it's important to heed its lesson. Yeah, you'll make it out here eventually, probably, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, so in your works, you a lot of the time have several different narrators at the same time. How do you develop viewpoints that are distinct from each other and balance all of them together without losing any of them? 
Well, I think it's a question that goes back to what I'd said earlier about actually doing the research, going, you know, taking those those drives with the with cab drivers, meeting with people, you know, discussing all of that. Balance is a, is a whole other matter, and it's it's complicated. You know, it's a it's a constant sort of arrangement of a plot of that kind of that real time sense of you know that real time yeah urge that a narrative can have. Um, and, and how that all comes together comes again through practice. It comes through reading, it comes through visualizing, it comes from rewriting, retelling, uh, and, and it's complicated. Maybe that, I mean, balance is, is, is where the art lives in so many ways. You know, there's a, you can, you can prescribe exercises and, and, and things to do, but, but the balance will always be personal, maybe. Maybe that's it. You know, I think the tricky part with with a certain sort of formulaic or genre writing is that that what you do is you kind of co-opt a structure that you then you know sort of enable with a with, with a certain amount of sort of plug-in scenarios. Um, but but if you let go of those, then then the balance of the material becomes your own, and and therefore. Therefore, it doesn't necessarily have to be your voice or your events. If we understand that what, that who you are is really how you choose to preference and relate whatever is set before you. You know, your that personality is always there. It doesn't have to distinctly describe skin color, belief systems, et cetera, et cetera. It can rely solely on how words are patterned. Now. The frightening thing is probably many of you are aware here is that the AI, you know, for for language is becoming increasingly more and more effective to the point that we can plug in, you know, all the books of of Updike or Toni Morrison, and it will actually render a speech that seems compatible. And so the question, the fear is, of course, that now correspondence can be faked. Huge amounts of, of interconnectivity can be generated with no connectivity at all. So is there a way that goes beyond the Blade Runner test, right, which is, the, which is visual, to actually how we listen to words, how we frame that, you know? And, um, and in some ways, it will probably be about whether you can sustain the narrative. It will be more long form because the short form will be able to ape, you know, even the most complex writers um, uh, pretty effectively, but can they actually sustain that? I don't know. So this is just a thought I had just now. Um, you're, you're talking about, you know, genre writing and how it, it sounds like you're saying, you know, genre writing in a way is you're almost just putting different situations on the same set of characters, right? So if you're creating a book, sort of, I'm thinking of the familiar right now, a book where you're almost, you're not going upon any set of characters or situations that we've really seen before, right? And you plugged it into that, like an AI system, do you think something would be able to predict off of that? Or is it so unheard of at this point that it, there isn't really a formula? Yet. Well, it could predict something. Mm -hmm. Whether it would predict the thing that would be my thing is highly unlikely. Um, but that isn't to negate what potentially could result out of that composition. I mean, I, I was talking with an esteemed professor that thinks within a decade, if not sooner, um, artificial intelligence will be able to write novels that we will be unable to distinguish from, you know, the living author. So it's a terrifying thought, thrilling, but at the same time, it's like, okay, if that output is achievable, the speed with which that output um, is accomplished will be extremely fast. So potentially the familiar could be completed by an AI that would carry out all sort of various you know, <laughs> arrangements to a certain degree. I mean, it would, it would be infinite, but, but it could begin to kind of fill in, you know, um, sort of what, it could provide its own anticipations. Um, but then if it's that powerful, it could potentially 
produce with lifelike, you know, animation, CGI, the, the, the novel that it in fact had created, you know. I guess the final step that I didn't bring up with my professor would be um, my professor friend, I guess I was learning my professor, is will there ever be an, an AI that can read the book that it writes? And maybe necessarily to write that book, it has to read it. So therefore, what would the book be that the AI um, wanted to read? I would posit that only revolutions would be high on the list. <laughs> Um, so you spoke a bit about, you know, your process of, you know, conceptually developing the familiar, right? You know, you have the, the image of the cat and, and Xanther initially, and it's, it sounds like it's a, you know, a big collection of ideas. Um, was it similar to that with House of Leaves? Did you have one governing idea that you sort of started off of? No, I mean, I, I joked because I, I think, you know, I come from a fairly musical family. My, my, my sister is just, you know, just, you know, pitch perfect, you know, um, genius when it comes to music. My father was a singer. My grandmother, who I never knew, was, was an opera singer. Um, and in some ways, I, I guess I think I, I sort of inherited and learned sort of the sensibilities of music, but without, without having ever the formal training. Um, and so for me, it was always like writing a score. It still is. All, all the books are um, in some ways, even the 50 year sword, just kind of a, a way of like, why would I just want to have the violins, you know, when I can have the timpani, when I can have the bass, when I can have the, you know, the, the flute and the clarinet. And so they all kind of work together to create that, that melody. Um, a friend of mine is a beautiful um, jazz musician. You know, I was, I was pressing him on how he was able to do this very complicated bass line that seemed absolutely, with his left hand, ob absolutely opposite to what he was doing with his right hand. And he said, the trouble is you keep thinking that the left hand and the right hand are separate. That the music that you hear so clearly that is different between the bass and the treble clef is, has to be completely, you know, um, orchestrated from different places. But I hear it all at once. And so then he played it very slow and I realized like, oh, he's not hearing the bass just going boom, 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 whatever. It's boom, did it. It's all at once. And so in many ways, that's the best metaphor I can give for how all of the books I write work is there, there, there is this, this sense within my mind of all at once. And, and, and it's, and I guess oddly, given what we've been discussing, it's more musical than it is visual. You know? And that's, maybe that's kind of strange. I don't know. Maybe that's telling, maybe that's influential for the new book. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be going back and looking at that with that in mind, see if I find something different in it. Um, so switching gears to um, Only Revolutions, it seems as much a modern take on the epic poem as much as it is a novel, and also like an interesting story about America in a similar vein as the last question, what's your founding idea for this piece? How much was it a story about the people and how much was it a story about the place or is it equally both? Oh, well, I think definitely it's, it's it, the, the people in this way define the, the, the place to its detriment. You know, the, the only revolutions is a sort of political um, national critique, you know, the constant use of us, as you know, all the caps is constantly referent to you know the United States and the presence of animals, the way they you know they become increasingly the roadkill on the side of that highway. You know where where they have voice in the beginning, very much like like children watching animated movies find voice in everything and assume you know voice in the world. You know they begin to lose that um, that sound. And uh, I should add that as aware as I am of this subject, it is, it is incredibly hard to sustain it. And yet it is a work that's necessary and has to be practiced. Um, my, my daughter, when she was, she was only a few months, reminded me of, of how kind of, you know, um, imbricated with, with thought and kind of occluded with, with, with notions you know, her father's mind was when, when I woke up early as I do, 
and it was um, probably around 4.45, and she was just babbling, just nonstop. The cutest sound, but just these, this lovely burbling of noise. And I was like, oh, look at her, how wonderful. Look, she's just, she's just happily lying there in her crib, and she's just babbling at the world. And, and, uh, and I assumed, you know, it's baby talk. You know, it's baby talk. It's, it's, it comes from a place that we're not entirely sure about, you know, but it makes sense in terms of human development, blah, 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 blah. And I went on to look for my coffee and then I went outside and it was still dark. And it was at that moment that I realized that the canopy of trees was alive with birdsong of the dawn. And they were all talking. They were all whistling to each other. And I realized that my daughter wasn't just babbling, she was talking to the birds. And it was a reminder of how much I wasn't listening. I was so kind of caught up in my own head that I was missing this beautiful conversation that was going on. And of course she was aware of it and I wasn't. Um, and so back to your question, only revolutions you know, surfaced in my mind immediately as this love story you know, that at, between two teens who are at the height of that, that state of longing, wanting to leave, you know, sus, you know, the, their parents, their, 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 their social circumstances and be free and, and make good on this feeling of, of desire, lust, love, you know, compassion, empathy, um, pity um, for another. Um, but I also realized that it was also, of course, you know, having read, you know, Romeo and Juliet, Tristan and Isolde, you know, seeing all the road movies of American cinema, that here was also a highly sort of nar narcissistic codependent relationship and how beautiful to kind of use as a critique in a way for, for the landscape through which they would traverse. They were unaware of so much, you know? And, and that's certainly something that, that was sort of practiced as I did number numerous road trips around the United States to sort of kind of gather this this information and feeling is that how often as we're moving one from one place to another, do so many exits blur by, so many names that we forget, but periodically maybe think about and go, oh, I wonder what that road leads to and what would happen if I would stop. And yet they just blur by very much like these historical columns that are sort of the, the, the road paint, if you will, of that visual roadmap that you have in your hand in only revolutions. Yes, you can stop, you can look at it, you can parse what it means, how it connects to that moment, but you can also allow it to just blur by because that is the experience of the road trip. So those kind of feelings were very present before I actually, you know, got to the writing. Who knew I, it was all so simple? <laughs> that, that's so neat, the, the tie between, yeah, I love that. The, the tie between the book and that story with, with your daughter, that's, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Um, we have one last um, question before we open up to questions from the audience here. Um, this actually ties in directly to um, what, we, what you were talking about with House of Leaves, how, um, how you, know, you feel like you're almost an orchestra, it sounds like, instead of a, you know, a solo instrument. Um, we're, so when you look at you know, mediums that have influenced you as a creator and this can be you know visual visual art written work musical um what are some of the strongest things and the things that have the most impact on you that you've been exposed to hmm the house of leaves is pretty explicit about its education and my own and and in in, in many ways i wanted to sort of you know make clear in many of the long lists exactly the books that I felt were, were you know, influential. And, uh, and that extends also to the, to the parts in the back where you can see you know, meaningful quotes from the likes of you know, Homer and whatnot. Um, and so in that way, it, it is, um, you know, those are, those are the sort of, you know, um, those, are, those are kind of the sources that make in many ways um, House of Leaves, a journeyman's piece, in the sense that that it's that it's that it's the it's the result of work that was done, you know, um, thanks to these greats. 
uh, only revolutions becomes a, a sort of an act, another act of, of reinvention. So its influences are, are wider in a way. They're the, they're the, um, they're the various stories that I encountered when I was, you know, touring with House of Leaves, touring with my sister, um, uh, when we did a crazy tour opening for Depeche Mode and went to a bookstore called Borders across the nation, which no longer exists. I mean, just, you know, um, but, but in the, you know, in the sort of signing sessions that followed, there was always an opportunity to have conversations about, you know, about the road, traveling, longings. And so then that became sort of very much a part of it. Now that's not to, that's not to divorce uh, only revolutions from the likes of, you know, of Whitman and Wordsworth and, and, you know, even kind of like a kind of engagement with the music of beat poetry and free verse in a way that, that, that kind of says, does it have to be this way? Or can, can that spirit be in a way enchained by this, by this, this, these, these, tight, you know, rules that's 360 pages, 360 words per page, 36 lines per page, you know, and how does that in a way begin to generate its own language as we start to use the idiom of, of teenagers throughout, you know, um, uh, two centuries of, of United States his history. Uh, so, so those influences then became more about like literally spending hours every day looking at microfiches of, of, of certain historical moments. Um, and so there's kind of a confluence of, of the expected greats, but at the same time, sort of new, very, you know, un, unheard of, unpublished, unprinted kind of news. Um, and I think, I think uh, certainly, you know, the rest of the books continue in that tra trajectory. And, 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 you know, there, I could, and I probably should. I try on some on social media to sort of to to showcase some of the books that I really enjoy reading at that moment. Um, I, I think as you get older, influence becomes more difficult. It, it, you do become more confident in who you are, and so you enjoy things, um, but they don't necessarily change you in such a radical way, you know. And so for me, I, I think the next step is to move become beyond these great, you know, moments of practice, novels, as we discussed earlier, into the practice of allowing the influence of the world that's out there. You know, I think jo Joyce was rumored um, to have said right before he died when someone approached him, you know, what they should do to become a, a writer. And he sort of squinted at them and said, just study the trees, you know, and, and I, it resonates to me at my age and, in, in, you know, that it is, it's important to allow the influence of the peacock that appears suddenly in my, in my room or in my yard, in my room, <laughs> this is my room too. But also, you know, how do we engage the rats that I see suddenly scurrying, you know, as an owl swoops by? And, you know, these are very sort of explicit ways of kind of addressing how even the air moves and, and whatnot. Um, but the quest is to keep reading and to keep practicing and admire those people who've just, you know, done exceptional work. And they're, they're certainly, you know, the Topeka School, Ben Lerner, you know, um, Exit West uh, by Hamid. Um, you know, there's just some great books out there, you know, and, and, that, and there should be, again, a constant diet of addressing them, experiencing them. All right, awesome. Thank you. Um, that's that's the end of our questions in general discussion. I'm going to stop the recording now, and we're we're going to open up to um, our participants now. If anyone has questions. <laughs>